Thanks, Ed. Um, morning. My name is Tom. I'm one of the leaders here. And just to pick up on what Ed said, if English is your second language or third language or not your first language in any case, um, my notes are also in our app. So you can just follow a little link and read along if that helps. Um, one other brief note, um, we often do a time of question and response after talks um, because, as you can see, we uh, will be celebrating communion this morning. Um, we're just not going to have enough time for that, but I want to make sure that if you do have questions, uh, that you're welcome to come up to me. Come find me afterward, or you can email me. Uh, my email is very easy. It's just tom at hopecityedinburgh.org. So... Thanks very much. Have you ever experienced a moment where you were sure that you've been in a situation before? That the events around you seem so familiar that you might almost be able to narrate what's going on. Now, the French have a term for this. They call it déjà vu. Uh, which literally translates, I'm told, to already seen. It's a different moment, but you feel like it's already happened. You know what's going on. Anybody experience this? I think I have at one point or another. Uh, apparently some two-thirds of the human popula population will experience it at some point in their lives. And you'll be glad to know that I'm not going to talk about the depths of human psychology this morning. But I am gonna highlight something that I think we should be aware of, and that is biblical deja vu. In case you're wondering, it's a term I just made up. <laughs> but I think it works, I think it works. Let's call biblical deja vu the experience of encountering a passage of the Bible that seems almost identical to something we've seen before. It's the feeling you get when you read a passage and think, oh, this is like that other story. Let's skip ahead, find something new. But if we believe that the Bible is given to us from God, that it's true, that it contains eternally important guidance and instruction for us, then we need to reflect and study all of it. Further, if we see such similar events happening, it should cause us to stop and figure out why they're both there. And this is a very long preamble for the story of the feeding of the 4,000. Now, I appreciate some visitors are here who had not heard Pat talk about the feeding of the 5,000 a few weeks earlier. I actually wasn't here either. I was on paternity leave. But many of you in the room will have just heard about this miraculous feeding. And as I invite David up to read our passage for us this morning, you might feel just a little biblical deja vu, but stick with it. So if you're using one of the uh, Bibles on your seats, it's in page 982. And it's Matthew 15, beginning at verse 29. Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee, then he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and led them at his feet, and he healed them. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled made well, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they praised the God of Israel. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry, or they may collapse on the way. His disciples answered, Where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied, and a few small fish. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves and the fish, and when he had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples, and they in turn to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was 4,000 men, 
besides women and children. After Jesus had sent the crowd away, he got into the boat and went to the vicinity of Magadan. Thanks very much, David. So there's a sense in which we've seen almost all of this before. Jesus is leading people up a mountain. There are healings. There's a miraculous multiplication of food. We've been there, done that, right? Actually, there's even more similarities than between the feeding of the four and the 5,000 than you might have clocked. I found a little list that uh, addresses some of the similarities between the two, and it actually doesn't even fit onto one slide. It's pretty striking, right? Lots and lots of similarities here. But to circle back to this idea of biblical deja vu, what we need to be really careful that we don't just zone out when we encounter similar stories. We need to pay close attention, particularly to what's different here. And I think the most important difference comes back to where the story takes place. So where is Jesus? The passage David read said that Jesus has moved. Last week, Luke mentioned that Jesus and his followers were in the region of Tyre and Sidon, and that's where they encountered the Canaanite woman. This gives us a rough idea of where they may have been, northwest of Jerusalem, outside the areas where the Jewish people lived. But now Jesus has moved, but where to? Well, we know he ended up on a mountain, not the most clear geographic directions from Matthew, but Mark actually gives us a more precise location. He says in Mark 7.31 that Jesus was in the region of the Decapolis. Now that's not a city, uh, but it's an area comprised of a bunch of different cities of varying size. Uh, it might be kind of like we described the central belt of Scotland, but what's most significant about the Decapolis is not its boundaries, but who lived there, namely Gentiles. Gentiles is one of those words that appears so often in the Bible and so often in talks from the front that we can almost take for granted that people know what it means and all that's implied by saying it. But it's worth asking, who are these folks that live in the Decapolis? Essentially, these are cities that were conquered and colonized by the Greeks in the centuries before Jesus. Alexander the Great and his crew bulldozed a trail from Greece all the way to modern day India. And along the way, they took over cities and land that would help to supply their military campaigns with food and materials. The Romans ended up doing exactly the same. We've got Greek conquerors, we have Roman conquerors. After a few centuries of this, you can imagine that the local ways of life would have been pushed to the margins and people from all around the Greco-Roman world were settling there. They're bringing their own cultures and their own religious expectations with them. So these weren't just Gentiles in the sense that they were not Jews. There are people whose ancestors were connected with colonization, with oppression. And as you might imagine, the Jewish people wouldn't have been keen to have been seen with them, much less to spend time in their company. And yet, that's exactly what Jesus does. We saw this last week, how he miraculously drove an evil spirit from the daughter of a Canaanite woman. Luke was absolutely right. This section of Matthew, we can see the beginning of a trajectory that spans across the Bible and subsequent history. The idea that being part of the kingdom of God is not tied to your ancestry or your particular citizenship. It's a result of faith in Jesus. So what does Jesus actually do? Well, miracles. Two miracles in the context of several days. We're told that a huge number of people follows him up the mountainside. And people brought their friends who were in need of healing. Note the, the detail that Matthew shows us. He specifically mentions the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. This suggests a few things. First, remember, this is ancient Palestine. There are no escalators or lifts. The majority of people that Matthew highlighted for us wouldn't have been able to get there without great difficulty or significant help from friends or 
more likely both. Second, there's a slight difference between this and the previous miracle we saw last week. Last week, Jesus delivers a young girl from an evil spirit, whereas in this package, he's not driving out demons. He's healing physical maladies, quite standard ones, things that people struggled with then, things that people struggle with today. And it might not seem particularly different to us, but remember that Matthew is writing his biography of Jesus to people from a Jewish background. He makes some assumptions on the part of his readers that occasionally need unpacking for us. So for a Jewish reader, the people that we mentioned just now should jog a memory. Isaiah 35, 5 and 6 says, the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf, deaf unstopped. Then they will leap. Then will the leap, lame leap, excuse me, like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. N.T. Wright, a biblical scholar, former bishop, writes that this text is part of a passage where God promises that the people of Israel will be brought back from exile, coming safely through the wilderness to arrive at their home. Matthew is underlining his belief that the long-awaited time is now at last coming to pass, and that the healings are not just signs of special, though peculiar power. They're signs, three-dimensional signs, if you will, of the fact that Jesus is fulfilling the old prophecies. But time and time again, like we saw a few weeks ago, the Jewish leaders and theologians didn't see Jesus in that way. They saw him as a threat. People in Jesus' circles had already been murdered at this point, and there's an active plot underway to have Jesus killed as well. So while the theological elite of Israel had missed the signs about their promised deliverer, Matthew wants us to know that it's actually the Gentiles who are beginning to demonstrate faith and trust in Jesus. We saw this the last time in a small context with the Canaanite woman. Now we're seeing it happen on a grand scale. Look what Matthew writes. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled made well, the lame walking and the blind seeing, and they praised the God of Israel. That last part is really important. The response of those who were healed was praise to the God of Israel. We can imagine people who couldn't previously move their bodies lifting their hands to God. People who were previously mute using their voices to sing to God and worship. The Gentiles' response to Jesus' healing in their lives was worship. They don't go skipping down the mountainside. They don't go off to an IMAX movie to make the best of their newfound sight. They stick to Jesus like glue. They want to get to know him, to learn from him. They want to follow him to the extent that they run out of food. And that brings us to our second miracle. Look what Jesus says in verse 32. I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry or they may collapse on the way. Now, I don't know about you guys. I'm a bit of a worst case scenario guy. Are you guys worst case scenario people? I always have a spare bottle of water in the car in case I get stuck somewhere. In winter, I have a coat, sometimes a blanket, just extra, just in case. Um, but I've never had as much as three days worth of provisions with me. And yet we see in the passage here that these folks clearly don't want to leave Jesus, even to feed themselves. This is how enthralled they were with him. Part of this seems to be a geographic. The disciples say, where can we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? Now, a few things come to mind here. First, this does indicate that they're in a remote enough region that popping out to Greg's downstairs isn't an option. These people are sufficiently hungry that they actually couldn't survive the journey to go get more food. I don't think I've been that hungry, but I can imagine 
the lack of strength that these people are at at this point. Also, more to the point, this is one of those moments where the disciples really seem like idiots, <laughs> right? Where can we get enough food? How can we feed this multitude of hungry people? Think about it. They were among a very exclusive group of people that had actually witnessed a large-scale number of people being fed miraculously by Jesus from nothing but the lunch of a small child. You'd think that they might have some idea of what was coming. And maybe that's what they were thinking. Maybe we're being too hard. Maybe they thought, last time we said this, and then Jesus miraculously made tons of food people, so let's try it again. Maybe that's what they were thinking. Or maybe there's still in some degree of doubt over who Jesus is. Either way, I think Matthew's leaving it up to us to make up our own minds. But what is clear is that there's a massive crowd of hungry people. It's now dangerous. They can't go anywhere. They won't make it to food. And there's just a few scraps of food left. And Jesus takes the offered loaves and fish. He gives thanks to God for them. And then he keeps passing out more and more food to the disciples who distribute it to the crowd. It's worth a very brief aside to say that there are some skeptics who've tried to argue against miraculous feedings in the Gospels, and the argument usually goes something like this. Of course, Jesus doesn't have the power to actually create food from thin air. What really happened was that the people in the crowd saw the generosity of those who donated their last food, and then everybody pitched in as well, and it turned into kind of a potluck once everybody stopped hoarding all their food. And this is actually a fairly common interpretation of these passages, but I think it ignores a few points. First, do we really believe that if people had food reserves in such magnitude, they would have had any leftovers at this point? Or certainly not enough to share with others? Second, that both Matthew and Mark include not one but two accounts of miraculous multiplications of food should catch our attention. We're supposed to feel a little bit of deja vu here. David Turner helpfully observes, if this miracle is understood as occurring in Gentile territory, Matthew's purpose in including a second miracle story is evidently to demonstrate Jesus' concern for the Gentiles and to underline the theme of Gentile world mission with which this gospel concludes. And this brings us to our last questions. Why two mass feedings? Also, maybe why should we care? The quote from Turner raises a really important point. This isn't just more healing from Jesus for the sake of healing or feeding for the sake of a nice meal. In addition to demonstrating Jesus' power and his fulfillment of the prophecies about the Messiah, in the second miracle in particular, Matthew is showing his readers that a healing, transforming, transformative relationship with God isn't restricted to the people of Israel. That a healing, transformative relationship with God isn't restricted to the people of Israel. Now, to be fair, it's never been ethnically tied to the people of Israel. There's not an Israelite DNA factor in the Bible. We have examples of outsiders being brought into the people of God earlier in the Bible. Uh, you can think of people like Ruth, who not only finds hope in God's people, but actually herself is one of Jesus' ancestors. But what we see here is people from outside the Jewish tradition worshiping the God of the Israelites in response to Jesus' work and teaching. If you remember the talk from a few weeks ago, Jesus is continuing to dismantle the barriers of religiosity that had been put up by the likes of the Pharisees. A restored relationship with God isn't something you inherit genealogically. It's not being part of a particular nation. In our terms, maybe it's not simply having Christian parents and turning up to church each week. That's not what puts you right with God. The doors of the kingdom of God were, if you will, cracked open in the previous passage for the Canaanite woman on the basis of her faith, which was acknowledged and celebrated by Jesus. But in this passage, the doors to the kingdom are open wider 
Jesus is demonstrating that the Gentiles are welcome. And this is all part of a trajectory in Matthew's gospel. The gospel actually ends with Jesus' final instructions to his followers are to share the truth about his life, death, and resurrection to the ends of the earth. There's also one more image that we might miss, and that's what Jesus does with bread in Matthew's gospel in general. If you've been here for the past month or so, you may have noticed that bread comes up surprisingly often in these few passages. Let's zoom back slightly and see the trajectory. It starts in chapter 14. There's a feeding of 5,000 coming from five loaves of bread. Later on in chapter 15, when the Pharisees are up in arms because Jesus' disciples didn't purify themselves before they ate, the original Greek text, it actually says they didn't purify themselves before they ate bread. Last week, we heard about the conversation between Jesus and the Canaanite woman, and a big part of it revolves around the idea of bread and crumbs. And then we have today's passage. Again, Jesus is miraculously feeding people, and bread is a key component there. Why this emphasis? Is Matthew a big fan of the Bake Off? <laughs> was he hungry when he was writing these chapters? <sighs> or is there something bigger at work here? If we keep pulling back and we look ahead, Matthew 26 comes into view. And this takes place in the final days of Jesus' time with his disciples. They celebrate the Passover meal together uh, in a moment that we call the Last Supper. And the Passover, incidentally, was the time where the Jewish people set aside to remember, to commemorate, when they were saved from the death of firstborn children in Egypt. And they, in Egypt, had to kill a lamb and spread its blood across their door frames. And in doing so, they were literally and spiritually covered by the blood of this lamb, which had died in the place of their firstborn. And as part of the celebration of this in subsequent generations, they would eat bread and lamb meat and drink wine in memory of God saving his people. But what does Jesus do with this? Matthew 26 says, when they were eating, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I think this is actually where Matthew's bread imagery leads. Jesus isn't saying he's literally a loaf of bread. He's saying that he's going to be broken like this bread. He's saying that his blood is going to run down his body and into the dirt like he poured wine out of a bottle. And not long after this meal, Jesus was arrested, tortured, convicted, and executed. His body was broken. His blood poured out. But unlike the Passover, Jesus' death was sufficient to save all, not just the children of Israel, but people from every nation. And if your hope is in Jesus, if you believe and trust that he is the Son of God and your Savior who took the punishment for your sins, you can be part of his family. Following Jesus' death and resurrection, his followers regularly ate bread and drank wine together in celebration of Jesus' death and resurrection. The biblical authors sometimes wrote about this, and one set of verses in 1 Corinthians is particularly helpful for us this morning. The Apostle Paul writes, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we, who are many, are one body, for we all share the one loaf. So, celebrating communion or the Lord's Supper isn't merely a way to reflect on Jesus' death. It is a way to reflect on Jesus' death, but it's not just that. We reflect on Jesus' death in all sorts of ways. It's something more. First, it's a family event. 
You may be fortunate, as I am, to be able to take communion with your family members. But I mean something more here. When Paul says that communion is a participation in the body of Christ, he's meaning that this is something that's a universal experience for the whole church. When we worship in this way, we stand alongside brothers and sisters in the underground church in China. We stand alongside brothers and sisters being persecuted in Nigeria, family members who we've not met but are truly our family in that we share the same Savior. So if you don't have a physical family, you are still in a very real and tangible way part of God's family. And you're also part of your church family. Second, in communion, we picture and practice what it is to depend on God. Much like the people that Jesus fed in our passage this morning, despite being healed and made whole again, they were hungry and they couldn't have gotten to food on their own steam. Without Jesus, they would have been helpless. And that is how we come to the Lord's table. We don't dance our way up the aisle bragging about our perfect devotional lives or how we memorized the book of Jeremiah or how much money we've donated to charity. Coming to the Lord's table is a declaration of dependence. This should be the moment of all moments where we recognize we didn't get here on our own steam, but solely because of Jesus' perfect life, saving death and resurrection. Finally, the Lord's table should be a place where we are mindful of the overflowing mercy and provision of God. This might sound a little strange. After all, it's a few centimeters of cut up bread. There's nothing special about the bread. There's nothing special about the wine. There's actually really nothing special about the wine. They're symbols. They're symbols of the boundless, bottomless love and provision of a God whose storehouses never run empty. My uncle, who passed away recently, was an amazing cook. To be honest, he excelled at hospitality, full stop. You'd turn up at his house and he'd already know what you liked to drink and he had a glass poured for you when he walked in. He would have been working for hours to get food ready so that he could spend time with you when you came over. It was always a multi-course menu cooked to perfection. My cousin James, who's also in ministry, reminded me of something my uncle used to say when he would invite us around to dinner. He would always say, come hungry. To come hungry. And I think this is exactly the posture we should take as Christians when we come to the Lord's table. It's not that we need to beat ourselves up over our shortcomings. It's to acknowledge that actually we've got nothing to contribute except our hearts and our lives. And it's also an encouragement to be like the Gentiles on the mountain, transformed by Jesus' healing and also fully dependent on him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, in one story you demonstrate your love, your power, your healing, and your compassion. Thank you for your son, that he emptied himself in order to come to earth as a man, that he knows what it's like to be human, that he lived a life of righteousness that we could not live and took on himself the punishment we deserved. Thank you that because of this, we're in union with him and accordingly united to one another. May we live lives transformed by this reality. In Jesus' name, amen.